around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. This is Pastor David Langford. We'd like to welcome you today to this edition of The Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. It is Monday, November the 25th, 2019, and we welcome each of you today to this edition to this series wherein we're teaching on repenting and repentance, how needful it is that we repent. I try to live a life of perpetual repenting. There's probably never a time when I get down to pray that I do not ask God to forgive me of something that I might not even be aware of because I want to have clean hands and a pure heart because those that have clean hands and a pure heart, the Bible says, will dwell in the temple of the living God. So it's imperative. It is imperative that we live a life of repentance. If you'll go back and read Daniel chapter 9, he made his personal confession relative to sin. And then he talked about confessing sin in behalf of the nation of of Israel. So this great, great man of God understood without a doubt the gravity of repenting. He knew because of the greatness of God, greatness of God, he needed to be a man of perpetual repentance. In Daniel 9 verse 4, he said, and I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession, and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Verse 5, we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Notice the next phrase. Verse 6, Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all people of the land. Now, what Daniel is saying here is that we didn't hear the messengers of God. We would not listen to them. I am certainly not a prophet. I'm an evangelist. But I preach a message of repentance, and we must repent. But you see, people don't want to hear that message today. And for the most part, most pulpiteers, that's what they are, pulpiteers. They're nothing but mere charlatans and puppets. That's all they are. They're puppets. They preach, and they produce, they advocate, they appropriate a seeker-friendly church. I'm telling you, you watch 99.9% of ministry and ministers, whether it's radio or television, they never preach repentance. And yet we see the prophets preaching, decreeing, crying aloud, sparing not, and preaching repentance. Jesus preached repentance. And yet... We don't see that today. You see, that's the gospel in a nutshell. Once a man repents and gets right with God, he then can grow in grace and in knowledge. These people have a vast amount of knowledge, but they're not growing in the grace of our Lord. This is a, this is a time in history when knowledge is profoundly accessible. You can get knowledge anywhere and everywhere. But the question is, can you get truth? Can you get truth? This is the emphasis at the Voice of Evangelism to preach the Word of God, to preach repentance, and see lost people, sinners, backsliders, 
the cold, the lukewarm, the indifferent, the tepid. Come to Christ and live the life that Christ demands. He demands that we overcome. He demands that we become disciplined. He demands that we take up our cross daily and follow him. He said in Luke 9, 62, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. I didn't say that. Christ said that. So if we're going to make it into the kingdom of God, we must repent. Jesus said in Mark 1, 15, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. The day of Pentecost, Acts 3, 19, Peter said, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. What does he say? He says, we must, print, we must repent. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. In other words, totally eradicated, absolutely, totally removed. And when the times of refreshing or the times of revival shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now, my once saved, always saved brethren and sisters, notice he says, blot out their sins. But he also says, if you don't repent, if you don't overcome, I will blot out your name. Revelation 3, 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. His angels. Repentance is so needful today in America. And yet people act as though they have nothing to repent of. The truth is, we have much to repent of. I don't know when this song was written. It's called Wayfaring Stranger. Wayfaring Stranger. If you're watching us on YouTube, regretfully we can't play the songs on YouTube because of copyright infringement. But Blog Talk lets us play it because there's no video. It's just mere audio. And uh, this is a powerful, powerful song. I don't know when it was written, but Selah recorded it back 13 years ago. But I want you today to listen to the words and the power of this song. It begins by saying, I'm a poor wayfaring stranger. While traveling through this world below, there is no sickness, toil, nor danger in that bright world to which I go. I know dark clouds will gather over me. I know my pathway is rough and steep. But golden fields here lie out before me where weary eyes no more shall weep. I'm going there to see my father. I'm going there to to no more roam. I'm going over Jordan. I'm just going home. I'll soon, soon be free from every trial, and this from will rest beneath the sod. I will drop the cross of self-denial and enter into my home with God. I'm going there to see my Savior, who shed for me his precious blood. I'm just going over Jordan. I'm going over home. Wayfaring stranger. We're all just pilgrims passing through this world. And I pray today that that song and its uniqueness minister to you in a very, very personal way. Last week when we finished Tuesday's program, we were addressing the 14th chapter of the book of Ezekiel, 
and how that God was opposing Israel because of their idolatry. They were embracing idols. We quoted from 1 John 5, 21, My little children, keep yourselves from idols. Anything can become an idol in your life. I-D-O-L, not I-D-L-E, like an engine idling, but an idol, a statue. You say, well, I, I would never bow down to a statue. You don't have to. You don't have to. Because the idols that God is talking about is the idol in their heart. There in Ezekiel 14, verse 5, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart. Verse 4, Ezekiel 14, verse 4, every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart, in his heart. Now, an idol can be anything. It can be a person. It can be a job. It can be money. It can be greed. It can be lust. It can be self-aggrandizement. It can be so many things because it is in the heart. It's not tangible. You can't touch that idol in your heart, but you can touch that idol that you have embraced, maybe physically like a job, money, a person, a car, uh, sports, whatever it might be. But the idol is in the heart. That's why it's called idolatry. Because people would say today, well, I would never be such a pagan and a heathen to bow down to, bow down to a type of statue. I wouldn't do that. But yet the idol is in the heart. Because God deals with the heart of men. He deals with their hearts. People's hearts can be cold. People's hearts can be calloused. People's hearts can be tender. They can be moved upon by the power of the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God can touch men's hearts. That's what he wants to do. He talks about having a heart of stone and a heart of flesh. When one has a heart of stone, it's harder to break that. It's harder to penetrate that. That's the reason the Bible says in Jeremiah 23, 29, it's not my word, like as a fire saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock into pieces. This is why we preach Bible. We know we are ineffective, Uneffective if we just expound, pontificate on worldly events. We must preach the Word of God. You know, everybody's writing books today, left and right, this book, that book, whatever. But yet they never mention repentance. They are purveyors of knowledge. It's almost like Gnosticism, salvation through knowledge. But you can't be saved through knowledge. You can only be saved by confession. You have to believe in your heart. Again, that fleshly, spiritual heart. Not the calloused, stony heart, but the fleshly heart. The one that God can move into in the sense of it being spiritual. You can have all the knowledge in the world. And that's exactly what the Bible says. They would be ever learning, 2 Timothy 3, 7, ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You can learn about a plethora of subjects, events, etc., etc., but the greatest knowledge is the knowledge and knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, you don't know anything. We're told in 2 Peter 3.20, excuse me, 2 Peter 3.18, and grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter tells us the important knowledge. The important knowledge is to know Jesus Christ, and we are to grow in that. 
The question is, are you growing in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? That's what we are to grow. That's what we are to mature in. Our objective at the Voice of Evangelism is to be a ministry of soul winning. I hear all of these preachers today preaching, but I seem to see no interest in the lost souls. They want to tell you how to get rich. They want to tell you how to sow a seed offering, and you get all of these unfathomable blessings. It's like playing the lottery. You might hit the jackpot. You, 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 you might succeed and get a, a promotion or whatever the case might be. I see it all the time. You see it all the time. I'm interested in where you're going to spend eternity. I want you to be blessed. I believe in the blessings of the Lord. I believe God prospers his people. And as Solomon said, he addeth no sorrow to it. When God blesses, there's no sorrow. When we do it in the flesh, there's always a curse. There's an aberration. There is an anomaly. There is pain. There is sorrow. There is suffering. First Timothy 6 and 10. The love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You see, there's much sorrow when we get riches unjustly or in the wrong manner or in the wrong way. God wants you to be blessed. He wants you to prosper. But he says he wants you to prosper as your soul prospers. Third John 2, beloved, I wish above all that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. Is your soul growing? Is your soul getting uh, uh, fat? Is your soul getting rich? I'm talking spiritual riches. I'm talking about getting fat on the riches, the goodness, the blessings of God. In uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 20, excuse me, 22. Proverbs 10, 22. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich. And he addeth no sorrow with it. See, there's no sorrow in the blessings of God. You get riches through carnal means, modes, and method. There is much pain. There is much sorrow. There is much hurting. There is much suffering. Why? It wasn't gained in a godly manner. I'll quote it again. 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Ungodly gain is a self-affliction. You, you self-inflict sorrow, pain, and suffering. That's why we don't preach about money here. We don't even make an appeal for anyone to send an offering. Now, I, I, I know we're probably the only ministry that I'm aware of. There may be others. I don't know. We're the only ministry that I'm aware of. We never ask you to send us money. We never close out the program and, and, and say, would you please sit down and send your best gift today? Would you send us silver? Would you send us gold? Would you send us diamonds? Would you send us your rings? Would you bequeath something to the ministry? We don't do that. Why? I don't believe God wants us to do that. Why? Because my source is God. Does God use people to bless? Absolutely. God touches people's hearts all the time to help the voice of evangelism, to continue to preach an uncompromising message from the word of God. But our emphasis is never on money. I can quote the verses, Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Shall men give into your bosoms? I know all of that. As I said, I, I can quote it. I don't say that braggingly, but I know that. But the emphasis is not money. The emphasis is on souls. If people are being touched, if the anointing of the Holy Ghost is upon the ministry and people recognize that anointing by God through the Holy Ghost, they'll give because they say, I'm being fed. 
I mean, we, we have Catholic people all the time write and say, man, I've never heard so much Bible. You're telling me things I've never heard in my life. Episcopalians, Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, even UPC. I have people from the United Pentecostal Church write me. That's a, that's a purported Pentecostal spirit-filled denomination. But they say, man, what you're teaching is so biblical and we've been misled in certain and particular ways. You see, there's the truth, then there's the part truth, and then there's the pure, unadulterated lie. But if it's not all truth, you better be weary. You better be careful. You, you, you better say, wait a minute. Every one of you listening to me today, if you're truly led by the Spirit of God, you will get a check in your spirit whether something is right or whether something is wrong. I don't have to tell you. I don't have to tell you when something is not lining up with the Scriptures. I hear people pontificate and preach all the time. I listen. I want to see if they're telling me the truth. Regretfully, I see that they're misleading. They're misrepresenting the scriptures because they're preaching what they've been taught. They're not preaching what they learned through the leadership of the Holy Ghost. They're preaching what's been passed down traditionally. I had things passed down to me that I sought the word of God and I said, this is not right. So I said, I'm not going to preach that anymore. I'm not going to teach that anymore because I saw the word of God said it's wrong. It's, it's so regretful that people have used ministry for a means of raising money. I had a gentleman say to me not too long ago, he said, man, you could get on the air and you could generate more money by making appeals. I said, I'm never going to do that. I'm, I'm not going to make those appeals. We've asked before if someone wanted to help us with the studio years ago. But because we've, we've, we've made it a point to stay away from that, God has blessed us and supplied the needs abundantly. He's been gracious. But the message that God wants preached in this hour is a message of repentance and to tell people to turn from their wicked ways. Isaiah 55 and 6, let the wicked forsake his way the unrighteous man, his thoughts. Let him return unto God, for he will be merciful and he will pardon sin, abundantly pardon sin. You see, when God pardons sin, he pardons all the sin. He doesn't leave an element of sin in your life. He pardons all the sin. Isaiah 55 and 6 and 7. Let me quote that again. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. There is abundance of redemption if we will only confess our sin. Only confess our sin. There's never a lack on God's part of having enough mercy and enough redemption. Psalms 130 verse 7, let Israel hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy and with him is plenteous redemption. Plenteous. There is plenteous. There is plenty redemption on God's part for you and I. There's never a lack of forgiveness on God's part. I said there is never a lack in the ability to forgive sin on God's part until a man uh, becomes a reprobate. Now, after a man becomes a reprobate, he is void of judgment. 
He has no conscience that can be convicted by the power and by the Spirit of God. Romans 1, 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Once you become a reprobate, you will say anything, you will do anything. You're, 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 you're a walking dead man. Your doom is sealed. What a tragedy. When you become a reprobate, you become a vessel fitted for wrath and destruction. Fitted for wrath and destruction. You, you never want to come to that place in God. You never want to come to that place in God where you become a vessel that is fitted for wrath and destruction. You say, does, is that biblical? Absolutely. Romans 9 and 22. What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction. Now that word fitted there says they've been made. They've been made to be a vessel of wrath. Why? Because they kept refusing the leadership of God. They kept refusing the power of God. 2 Timothy 2 and 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Paul is telling us there are vessels. Every one of us are a vessel. We are a vessel. We are a tabernacle. We are a implement of God. And when you, when you get to that point and state in sin, where the Holy Spirit of God does not deal with you, you then become a vessel of dishonor, a vessel fitted for wrath and destruction. Now, you've heard me make this statement. Somebody has to fulfill those negative verses in the Bible. Some have to fulfill those positive verses in the Bible. You see, the choice is yours. You have to choose. You will have to make a decision. Will I travel the straight and the narrow path? Or will I travel the easy path? The path that leads to destruction. And that path, the Bible says, many there be which go in thereat. Matthew 7, 13, 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Few there be that find it. If I ask you, what is a few of a hundred? Would you say 20? I wouldn't. Would you say 10? I wouldn't. I would say two, three, four, five. At the most, a few of a hundred. You see, this is nothing new. God's inability to find righteousness in the earth. Jesus said in Luke chapter 18, verse 8, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith in the earth. He knew it would be a time of apostasy, a time when reprobates would flourish. He said that. And let me say this. The church is not ready for persecution. I said the church is not ready for the onslaught of persecution that is coming to it. The world, America, for the most part, Americans hate Christianity. They hate it. Why do they hate Christianity? Because Christianity says you got to stop your drinking. You got to stop your adultery. You got to stop your fornication. You've got to stop your sodomy. You can't be a transgender. 
We don't believe in same-sex marriage. You see, as, as the Lord tarries, the world becomes more vicious and the world becomes more wicked because the church is being scrubbed, eradicated from our society. The day will come. It's already in Canada and other parts of the world. You cannot preach Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You cannot preach against homosexuality, even though the Bible says it is a sin. You can't preach against sin. Why? These lawless, reprobate, apostates will not hear it. I heard a man the other day, liberal as they can be, and he said, I have clergy on both sides of my family, on my mother's side, on my father's side. I thought, my God, what kind of clergy do you have in your family? Believe in same-sex marriage. Believe in homosexuality. They believe in abortion. I'm like, and you purport, you claim, you tell publicly that you have clergy on both sides of your family and you believe those kind of things? Well, what does that tell you? The man's a reprobate. Now, in the natural, he seems to be a man of somewhat reason, a man that has some type of understanding, but as far as functioning in life and in society, he seems to be all right. But when you mirror that man's ideology and understanding to the word of God, he is totally apostate. He is totally apostate. He has forgotten the word of God, and thus he has forgotten what manner of man he is. See, that, that's what happens to people when they get away from the Word of God. If you're not reading the Bible, you're failing yourself. If you're not reading the Bible, if you're not reading the Bible, you're hurting your own self. You're hurting your own self. Because when you read the Word of God, when you read the Word of God and you mirror what the Scripture says to your life, you realize you're failing, you're falling, and you're coming up short of God's word. We're told in James 1.22, Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. People deceive their own selves. James 1.23 and 24. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass or in a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. James says, he beholds his natural face, the King James says, in a glass, but it's in a mirror. You look in a mirror, you see yourself. You behold yourself. You turn away from the mirror, you walk out of the room. If you don't allow the word of God to have a place of residence in your heart, it's not long and you forget what manner of man that you truly are. Psalms 119 verse 11, David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You see, God's word is always a mirror and you're putting your life your lifestyle up into that mirror so you're seeing a reflection of who you really are. When you stay in the word, when you embrace the word, when you love the word, you witness, you see, you behold who you are in the sight of God, the sight of God. It is so tragic that idolatry is in the church, the body of Christ. As I said here, he said, I'm going to judge you according to the idols you have set up in your heart. Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 4 through 6. You see, Jehovah loved 
and had compassion on these hypocrites by telling them they must repent and turn from their idols and turn their faces away from their abominations. Even though they were hypocrites, they were embracing idolatry and abominations, God is being merciful to them. Turn yourselves from your idols, Ezekiel 14 and 6. Now notice verse 7. Ezekiel 14, verse 7, for every one of the house of Israel or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel. So you see, if you're just, you're not even, you're not even an Israelite, you're a Gentile, you're, you're, you're passing through your sojourner, which separateth himself from me. Separating yourself from God. Again, that's why we teach that once saved, always saved is an erroneous doctrine. Why? Because God says you still have free will. You can separate yourself from me and you setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me. I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. Just like many in America today, they say, well, we truly want help from God, yet they do not want to rid their lives of sin and their wicked ways. Instead of pronouncing judgment by the prophet, God declares, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. I'm going to answer. You remember when God came down, the 19th chapter of the book of Genesis, chapters 18 and 19, and the conversation with Abraham concerning Sodom and Gomorrah? What does God say? The wickedness and the sin of the twin cities has come into my hearing. Now he says, I'm going to go down. I'm going to do a investigation personally, and to see if what I'm hearing is in all actuality what they are doing. And again, it was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, or the sin of sodomy. People say, well, that's not a sin. God obliterated Sodom and Gomorrah because of their sins. Once you spurn and you reject God to the degree Though the Holy Spirit is trying to convict you of your sins and you say, no, I'm going to keep on going this way. I'm going to keep living this lifestyle. That's how you become a reprobate. You quench, you resist, and you grieve the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to listen to the Holy Spirit, some say. I'm not going to give up my lifestyle. I'm not going to give up the way that I live. Why? They enjoy the gratification of the sin. Now, I'm, I'm certainly a heterosexual man. I don't understand homosexuality. I've never seen a man that I wanted to kiss. I've never seen a man I wanted to sleep with. I, I don't understand that kind of degradation, and I don't want to understand it. I believe at the close of the day, it is demon possession. Now, just because a demon-possessed person doesn't act freaked out doesn't mean they're not demon-possessed. Demon-possessed people can act just as normal as you or I. But then when something spiritual comes against them and the Holy Spirit or the preacher or the preaching of the word against their sin rises up against them, then they become retaliatory. They become militant. I, I, I've said this for years and years and years and years. When you see sodomy rise up in its brutality, its ferocity, its militancy, you will know we are near the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Why? Because Luke chapter 17 says, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be also in the coming of the Son of Man. We are getting close to that time frame. And let me say this. They are brutal people. They threaten Lot to do worse to him than to those angels. He said, if you won't give us those angels, now they didn't know they were angels. So if you don't give us these men that we may know them, Lot, we're going to do worse to you. Now, I, I'm telling you, folks, that is sordid. That is horrendous. That is horripilating. That, that, that is horrifying. And don't think it's not grievous to the Holy Spirit of God. So now today, we have homosexual pastors, preachers. I don't believe a woman can be a bishop because the Bible says in 1 Timothy 3 that a man that is a bishop must be the husband of one wife. A woman can't be a husband. That's what's so silly about a man marrying another man and dec decrees my husband. Two men, something is wrong. You see, the mental mindset is totally disfigured. It is decrepit. It's demented. It is twisted. And regretfully, I read an article years ago, a decade ago or better, where your doctors, where your lawyers, where your dentists, where your everything, where 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 your politicians, where your congressmen, where your senators, we got one running for the presidency right now. And because I take such a stand, I get castigated from so-called Christians. I, I get beat up. Listen, I want the sinner. If he's an adulterer, a drunkard, a fornicator, a homosexual, I want him to be saved. But here's the problem. They tell you, I'm already a Christian. How do you deal with that? People that confess they are Christians. When you say you're a Christian, that means you follow the dogma, the tenets of whoever you're discipled to. If you say you're a Christian, I'm discipled to the tenets of Christ. But if you don't abide by the word of God, then you're deceived. And so we try to preach in a manner, in a way, to awaken people, to be awakened to the truth. Awakened to the truth. Let me say this in closing today. Great judgments are not only coming to America, but the purported church world that are full of religion and self-righteous acts. Self-righteous acts. That, that's what the church is today in modern Christianity. Ezekiel 18 and verse 30. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God, repent, and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Iniquity becomes your ruin, your utter demise, your utter destruction. What an altar call. What an altar call to people. Notice again, let me quote it again. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, according. You see, God judges us accordingly. It's, it's not by some mere whim or by some caprice. I will judge you accordingly, saith the Lord God. Repent, repent. Now remember, Ezekiel is writing this under the auspices of Israel being exiled in Babylon. 
They've been taken captive. Are they repenting? No. So Ezekiel in the exile is preaching repentance. And turn yourselves from all your transgressions so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Don't let sin be your destruction. Don't allow sin to be your destruction. Matthew 3.11 says, John the Baptist, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. But he it is who's coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly perch the floor and gather the wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This is the process. Repentance. Then water baptism. Then now God can fill us with the fire of the Holy Ghost. The unquenchable, the unquenchable fire is for the purpose of destroying and not purging. He will gather the wheat, that's the redeemed, into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff, that's the sinner, the backslider, the tepid, the lukewarm, the indifferent. He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This is the fire of judgment, and it cannot be quenched. God won't quench it. God will not lessen it. God's fire and judgment is the absolute full force of God because God, even his eyes are as a flame of fire. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Again, where are the messengers preaching repentance? Mark 1 and 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. John preached the baptism of repentance for the remission or the forgiveness of sin. Where are the preachers today? Where are the preachers today? Preaching repentance. This water baptism of John the Baptist is a mere sign or a symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection that we possess in Christ. Today, you need to understand repentance takes place first before you are water baptized. In John's water baptism, we see that water and repentance were joined together. However, the baptism in Christ is Holy Ghost and fire baptism. You see, people say today, some say, well, you have to have the Holy Ghost to be saved. You have to have the Spirit of God to be saved, but not baptized in the Holy Ghost. Romans uh, 8, 9. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. When you get saved, you have the Spirit of God. That doesn't mean you have the baptism in the Holy Ghost, though. Let me explain it this way. When you get saved, it's like filling a glass with water. So that glass is now full. Has that glass been baptized? No. The glass has not been baptized, but the glass has been filled with water. Now I can take that glass that's full of water, I can immerse it into the kitchen sink and baptize it, which is something totally, distinctly separate. Now I know that might be hard for some to understand, but that's the best I can explain it. When Christ saves you, Christ comes into your life. But see, John was preaching baptism under repentance, but he said there's going to be another baptism. It's the baptism in the Holy Ghost that's a different measure. That's a different aspect. And so 
Again, you can fill the glass to the brim with water and nothing can get in it. But you can now take that glass and immerse it into a bucket, a tub, or in the kitchen sink. And now it's baptized in the spirit. It was already filled with the spirit, but not baptized in the spirit. You can receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost without ever being water baptized. The book of Acts is filled with many who received the baptism in the Holy Ghost before they were ever immersed in water. You don't believe me? Read Acts chapter 10. They had the Holy Ghost. They were speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave others, but they had not been water baptized yet. So let me get this straight. You can be saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit, and still not be saved? Well, that's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. If it's the real Holy Ghost and you're speaking with other tongues as the Spirit, the Spirit gives the utterance. It's the Spirit. And people say, well, I know you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, but you're not still saved because you've not been water baptized. That's the most asinine statement that could ever be made. And, 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 and this, is, this, is, this is what some advocate and appropriate. This is why there's such unfathomable confusion in the church today. You see, that's why denominations divide us. Because they go out here and they say, well, this is the way it's got to be. Another denomination says, well, no, this is the way it's got to be. Then another denomination says, no, this is the way it's got to be. And so the reason we're divided is because we don't believe the word of God the same. Yet, throughout Pentecost, there were just very, very few Gentiles in the early church. It was mainly, mostly a Jewish church. And I hear that all the time. Well, the church was birthed at Pentecost. That's the most asinine statement. I hear it all the time. I hear it all the time. Acts 7, verse 38. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. The word church is ecclesia, the called out ones. God's had a church, we know, from Exodus chapter 2. But then you make you go all the way back to Genesis 15 or Genesis chapter 12 with the covenant with Abraham. The church has been many years. Thus Jesus said in John, or excuse me, Matthew 16 verse 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus was talking about the church. Stephen said in Acts 7, 38, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness. Who was in the wilderness? Israel, the called out ones, the ecclesia. I hope you're learning a vast amount of knowledge from the word of God and these biblical teachings. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow. Have a great day. Look up, lift up your heads for truly our redemption is drawing nigh. Amen. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.